The Wheatley Institution is a research institution at BYU, the purpose of which is printed on the backdrop behind me uh, to lift society and strengthen our core societal institutions. One of the major initiatives uh, of the Wheatley Institution is uh, dealing, deals with financial security for individuals and for families. And Ned Hill, as a fellow of the institution, has uh, taken a leading role in this initiative. Ned Hill is, as I mentioned, a fellow of the Wheatley Institution. He also served as dean of the Marriott School of Management from 1998 to 2008 and has been part of uh, Brigham Young University since 1987. Prior to his appointment as dean, he served for two years as an assistant to BYU President Merrill Bateman with responsibility for strategic planning in areas of facilities, space management, distance education, uh, in learn, uh, distance learning and information systems and assessment. Before joining the administration, he chaired the Marriott School's Department of Business Management. He joined the Marriott School as the Joel C. Peterson Professor of Business Management in 1978 and received the school's Outstanding Faculty Award in 1992. During 1976 to 77, he was an assistant professor at Cornell University and then from 1977 to 87 was finance professor on the faculty at Indiana University. MBA, he was a uh, MBA students at both BYU and Indiana University elected him their outstanding teacher on several occasions. Ned Hill is a widely published author and frequent speaker on the subjects of treasury management, electronic commerce, and personal finance. He was founder and senior, senior editor of EDI Forum, the Journal of Electronic Commerce, and has written four books and more than 70 professional articles. For several years, he served on the Information Technology Commission for the state of Utah and has been a regional director of the Financial Management Association. He holds a PhD in finance from Cornell and an MS in chemistry from Cornell and a BS in chemistry from the University of Utah. His topic today is, as you see in front of you, troubled times, origins and possible outcomes of the economic crisis. Professor Hill. Thank you, Richard. I'm delighted to be here and uh, to talk to you about a, a very interesting topic. Uh, this isn't an academic presentation. This is kind of an overview to try to help you understand and, and help me understand what's going on with this, these, this economic crisis. There have been uh, many uh, explanations of it, and there, there will yet be many, many explanations. This will probably be one of the most uh, studied economic times in the history of the United States. And uh, it took years to understand the factors that contributed to the Great Depression back in the 30s. And I suspect it will take years and years before we really come to grips with everything that's going on here. But I, at least I want to give you an overview of some of the uh, problems that we're, that we're in and, 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 and some ideas on, on why we might be in those problems. So I'll talk about kind of the siege of the economic crisis, the results, the failures, the mergers, the credit squeeze that we're in right now some of the remedies that are being attempted, and then some possible outcomes and suggestions on how we might uh, deal with the crisis. And I hope I can do that in the, in the time allotted here. Now, we come from a very strong economy, uh, one of the strongest and longest uh, boom times ever. We've had very strong entrepreneurial innovation. Most of the entrepreneurial ideas have, have been generated here in the United States that have propelled the whole world forward. Our productivity has increased dramatically for 20 or 30 years, almost without uh, uh, being reduced. And we've been for many years in a low tax, low interest rate, low unemployment rate environment. Now, it's interesting that the, the growth in the U.S. economy from 02 to 07 exceeded the entire Chinese economy. Just our growth in economy exceeded the Chinese economy. So uh, we really had some very, very prosperous uh, good times, and now we face some real difficulties. <clears throat> so let me kind of draw you a picture of some of the factors, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail of the factors that caused us to uh, go away from this, uh, these uh, uh, economically very good times. Uh, one was certainly the action of the Federal Reserve and other regulators. I think they share some of the responsibility in, in putting us where we are. Another is the housing market, and you all know a lot about that, and I'll try to bring those two things together. Another is the creation of new securities for which we did not understand the risks. 
and we treated them like they were securities we knew about, but we really didn't understand fully the risks of these securities. It became very a huge market. And then I think uh, rating agencies have something to do with that because they were the ones who said, well, don't worry about understanding those risks because we understand them and we'll tell you what the risks really are, and, and they didn't. And then I think there are some accounting rules that, that uh, uh, caused us to uh, have some problems here as well. And all of this is set in a backdrop of huge global demand for fixed income uh, securities. Uh, fixed rate debt market grew dramatically. So I'm going to take these one at a time and explain why they contributed to, to where we are now. And let's start with this huge global fixed rate investment market. Back in 2000, that market was about $36 trillion. This is a, a huge pool of investable funds that, that people like insurance companies and banks and individuals need to put in the market to get a return on it, and they are not putting it in the equity markets where stocks and uh, stocks are. They want to put it in a, a relatively safe place like the bond market, government securities, and so on, because they need to make sure they keep that money safe. Well, that market grew from 2000 to 2009 to $70 trillion. That's what the market was at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009. So you had this, the, the, these very, very hungry financial analysts uh, working for the people who own this money, trying to figure out where can we get really good rates of return and yet have it safe. And as I mentioned, these are insurance companies, individuals, pension funds, uh, governments, mutual funds, uh, investment funds of all kinds, banks, municipalities, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people want those kinds of returns, $70 trillion market. That's more money than most of you will see in, a, in your lifetime, right? <laughs> At least for a few weeks, anyway. So let me explain and draw a picture of, of, of how this happened with the mortgage market. And then, uh, pictures might be more powerful than the words I'm going to use later on. So let me draw you a picture of it. Uh, <clears throat> these are a bunch of mortgages. Uh, they represent people who are borrowing money to buy a house. And mortgages have some very nice features about them. They give a higher rate of return than the government was, U.S. government was giving on its fixed income security. So people were paying 5, 6, 7 percent on, on mortgages. And they were mortgages of all different kinds of flavors. Some of them, uh, the redder ones are more risky and the bluer ones are less risky and some in between are, are uh, different shapes of risk. Now it used to be that when you got a mortgage, the bank would hold that mortgage. They knew you, they knew that whether or not you had a job and such, and so they were very careful about giving you a mortgage and wanted to make sure you'd be able to pay the money back. And they held the mortgage, they collected the payments on it. We've gone far, far beyond that. Now, these mortgages all get packaged up by uh, those people who, who package mortgages, mortgage banks and mortgage brokers and such, and they, they uh, package them up and they form them into groups of mortgages, tranches they're called. If you speak French, you know what that means. So they form a tranche of really good mortgages and kind of middle, middle ones and then riskier ones and then some uh, very risky ones. And, and, and already we're now removed from the home buyer in the first place. And what do they do with those groups of mortgages? And these tranches might contain not just two or three mortgages but millions of mortgages. And in fact, it's even more complex than I'm drawing here, they might take the uh, interest from the mortgage and put that in one tranche and the principal of the mortgage and put in another tranche. And then they might borrow money to buy those tranches. And so it's a really complex security. But that, for our purposes, uh, they're just dividing them up according to risk class. Well, then they would get the investment, the investment banks would buy these big bunches of mortgages and they would buy them uh, with, a, with a, an entity, a company called a collateralized mortgage obligation. It's a security, but it's a company that actually is putting all this stuff together. And they put them in a nice pretty package called the CMO, collateralized mortgage obligation or collateralized debt obligation. And that package contains lots and lots of maybe millions of mortgages and they, and they sell off pieces of that. And now we're far removed from the individual buyer. And in order to sell those, they needed to get somebody to kind of certify what was in those packages, and so they got the rating agencies to uh, analyze the contents of those boxes and put their stamp of approval on them. And so the upper ones are really good mortgages. They got AAA status, and then rating agencies put AA status on the next one, and A, and BBB, and so on down. And then they would sell those to this huge $70 trillion fixed income market. 
and this fixed income market. They were delighted to get these wonderfully packaged mortgages. They didn't have to worry about whether or not this person paid or not. You know, somebody else would worry about that. They just worried about getting a nice, safe return on their investment, and they knew it was safe because it was rated AAA or AA or whatever, and they would be able to collect a much higher return than they got in the, uh, with the federal government. So that's kind of the picture as we, as we have it now. Simplified, admittedly, but, but that gives you the picture of the, the flow of mortgage money and, 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 uh, and, by the way, the risk then transfers also. Who holds the risk? Well, the people that own you know, some of that uh, 70, that they're buying these nice packages of stuff, they actually hold the risk. That got transferred on. Who made the money in the process? Everybody along the way, everybody that packaged the mortgages or sold the mortgages in the first place got the buyer to come in and buy it. Everybody made some money on the way. The rating agencies make money uh, by rating these things. And the uh, investors in the $70 trillion market, they made a lot of money also, hopefully a higher rate than they were getting on some of the other in investments they got. And to add another little level of complexity, there is something called a CDS, a credit default swap. And these became very popular in the past five or ten years. Warren Buffett, when he heard about these, he said, that is a train wreck waiting to happen. That's the worst thing everybody, anybody ever invented. And what it is, it's a guarantee by a third party, like a, a reputable company like AIG. They said, okay, you've got a pool of mortgages in there. We will insure that CMO against default. If the mortgage holders down there at the end of the chain, if they default on the mortgages, and the value of that goes down to a certain level, then we will trade that mortgage for some government bonds and make you whole again. So you could buy this kind of insurance from AIG and from other companies, these credit default swaps, to make it so that you had a pretty, really safe investment. Didn't really didn't have to worry about the mortgage, uh, the people who, who bought the home uh, early on. Okay, so now this $70 trillion market. They couldn't get enough of these CMOs and CDOs. They wanted more and more and more. And they put pressure down the stream there to uh, uh, the people who were initiating the mortgages to sell them more and more and more mortgages. Well, how do you sell more mortgages? Only so many people that qualify for mortgages, and so let's make the mortgages a little easier to get. Let's not ask if they have a job. Let's not ask if they have any savings. Let's not ask what their other obligations are. Let's just package these mortgages and put them together and, and sell them. And so that's what happened. We really lowered the standards to feed this enormous $70 trillion market that was hungering for these wonderful uh, mortgage instruments. Does that sound like a disaster waiting to happen or what? <laughs> okay. So now, how did all these people play a role in that? Well, the Fed and other regulators, the Fed in 2004, under uh, Mr. Greenspan, thought that the economy was what, much weaker than it was, and so he was pumping more and more money into the economy, a very loose money policy. That keeps interest rates really low, which is not what this $70 trillion mortgage uh, 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 fixed income market wants. They want higher rates. And so uh, they didn't satisfy that market, uh, creating pressure to create something to satisfy those people. Now, our dollar sank in value because of the artificially low interest rates relative to the yen, yen and the euro. Commodity prices then rose rapidly. Uh, a lot of the increase in oil prices, for example, were purely as a result of, of the uh, dollar sinking against the uh, other currencies in, in, in the world. And then lack of regulations when these new uh, things like CDOs and CMOs and, and uh, credit default swap, swaps came out, we didn't understand them very well, and so we didn't regulate them very well. We didn't realize how toxic they could be. And then uh, 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 both presidential administrations, starting with the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, they leaned on the Fed to maintain this easy money policy. And in fact, they leaned on Freddie Mac and Franny, uh, uh, Fannie Mae to uh, make housing more affordable to people and, and, and uh, lower their standards. So, so the uh, Fed and other regulators really uh, created uh, some of the, the problem there. And of course, then the housing uh, market, a big, big part of this. Housing prices began because of the increase in commodity prices to grow rapidly. We had tax laws that, that encouraged people to invest in houses because uh, you don't have to pay capital gains on the increase in your house prices most of the time, so it was a great investment. And then, of course, uh, I mentioned the, these fancy loans that people, people got. 
uh, and salt. Uh, then the distance, I'm, as I mentioned, from uh, the people who originate the loans, the mortgages, to the people who actually hold them in the end uh, created all kinds of problems. And so there are problems all up and down the chain. Home buyers uh, sometimes didn't tell the truth when they were applying for loans. The appraisers sometimes didn't tell the truth. We had a big case of that in Orem here in Provo and Orem. Mortgage processors uh, were, were pushing, being pushed to get more and more loans and they made nice commissions on it, so let's get anybody we can in and not worry about asking questions. So they all played a part in, the, in this whole process. And then we created these new securities that uh, sliced and diced mortgages into ways that were unrecognizable and, and not really accountable either. Uh, and so the problem was that when you try to value these things, we didn't have the data that we're facing now, the, the uh, uh, default rates, for example. We assumed that the default rates were the same that they were over the past 10 years. I think that's what the uh, rating agencies thought. Let's just use the recent default rates. And we had never seen default rates like we're seeing now because we didn't have mortgages like we're seeing now. We didn't have the lax standards like we're seeing now. So none of the data that we had to, to value these instruments really worked uh, in actuality. And of course, rating agencies that everybody looked to. Uh, I'm on the board of an insurance company in Salt Lake, and we didn't have a big staff to analyze uh, CMOs and CDOs, and we saw the higher rates of return, and so our investment people said, yeah, we ought to invest in those. We get a better rate of return, and they're rated AAA. So we bought a bunch of those lovely, pretty packages that I described, and one day they were rated AAA. Next day, they were junk and uh, lost a whole bunch of money, money in them. So people really didn't understand the risks that uh, were being faced in this market. Now, are there ethical issues involved? Yeah, all up and down the line. And there are some very, very obvious ones that, uh, that uh, we run into. Uh, home buyers, uh, to start there, you know, wanting to buy bigger homes than they could possibly afford with the assumption that housing prices always rise, don't they? And so it doesn't matter if I can't afford this, I'm going to go out on a limb and buy it anyway because I'll be saved by the equity appreciation in my house. The mortgage originators who, who were encouraged, uh, encouraged these house buy home buyers to uh, do that sort of thing. Those who packaged the mortgages together, knowing that they were putting in mortgages that weren't very good quality. Uh, the investment uh, and commercial banks and who put those packages together and arranged them into CMOs and CDOs and sold them into the marketplace, the rating agencies as we mentioned, uh, rating stuff they really didn't understand and th there was some good information that they knew they didn't understand it very well but they figured oh well housing prices always go up. Uh, w uh, one person asked uh, one of the rating agencies who was a uh, person in the rating agency who was responsible for some of the modeling they were doing on the mortgages and, and why they were rating them AAA. And, and the person at, in the rating agency he said, well, our model doesn't allow us to put in a negative rate for the price appreciation. We can't even model prices going down in the homes. And so they, they couldn't even fathom that possibility. And then lack of oversight from regulators, investment funds chalking up on these, uh, stocking up on these things because they gave rate of return, of course, to government officials and elected representatives. Uh, greed, dishonesty, uh, short-term gains versus long-term consequences and uh, passing the problem that they knew existed on to others. I talked to one of our students in the uh, business school uh, not too long ago uh, who said, well, I was one of those who originated those mortgages. I knew they weren't any good, but, you know, when we sold them to other people, we figured, well, they'll do the analysis, they'll figure they'll be okay. And so uh, his conscience was clear because he, he passed it on to somebody else thinking he didn't have to worry about it. Now there's some deeper ethical issues as well. These come from uh, Tom Donaldson. And, and we, uh, last week we had a, a conference here uh, with the Wheatley Institution, an ethics conference, and uh, he was one of our guest speakers. And he, he noted three things related to this, uh, this crisis. One is what he called paying for peril. We give bonuses now. We pay the people now for originating the mortgages, for selling the uh, CMOs and CDOs. And, and we, we pay them now because we think there'll be future benefits to the shareholders who ultimately own the company who is uh, employing these people. And yet there is no, no uh, give back if that employee who got that big bonus uh, uh, for selling some product and that product actually didn't work out. Those mortgages weren't actually good. That, that bonus had already been paid. That person runs away with it and, and, and it's gone. So, and, and also, 
We, we give uh, uh, the brokers uh, uh, the, as an incentive to the people who sell these products. If they sell, they, they get a big bonus. Uh, if, if they invest in something and the price goes down, we don't take that money back from that. It's not a symmetrical deal. So they, they get paid for upside potential, but they don't pay for downside risk. So a big problem in how we, how we incent people who make these decisions. And then, uh, then the problem he calls normalization of bad behavior. And this is very common, and I think it's a lack of ethical courage. And uh, uh, many people, when they were involved in this market, said, look, I know, it's, I know we're in trouble. I know think bad things are going to happen, but uh, everybody is doing it. If we don't do it, our shareholders will scream at us. If, if I don't sell these mortgages, my boss will scream at me. I've got to do it because everybody else is doing it. And very, very few people said, wait a minute. The emperor has no clothes. We've got to stop. We've got to change what we're doing here. So lack of ethical courage is the way I would say, say that. And then also just, just an understanding. We, we know how to deal with a lot of securities we've dealt with for many, many years. These new securities, we haven't figured out how to deal with them. We didn't know how to value them. There, there, there are some uh, mathematical models that show you how to evaluate a, 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 CDO or a, a CDS, for example, credit default swap. And we used to use that. It doesn't work. I'm on a board of Morgan Stanley Bank back in New York City. We used the old model. It did not work for evaluating these kinds of securities. Now we have a better model. Now we figured out how to do it better when we understand more of the risks. And so gradually we were figuring out, figuring out ways to uh, deal with the problems. But that didn't keep us from plunging ahead uh, when we didn't really understand what was going on. And that's where regulators and others should have to have the ethical courage to come in and say, wait a minute, we don't understand that. Let's wait till we do. Now there's an additional factor. My apologies to my accounting rule friends. Uh, the, 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 I call this stabbing the wounded. Uh, the intent of this rule of marking the market is to accurately report the value of a firm's assets and liabilities and so on. So mark to market means that uh, if, if you hold uh, an investment as a firm, you have this thing called a, a CDO or a CMO, and the price of that goes down, then you have to take a loss. You have to write that off your balance sheet as, as, as a loss. And the problem is mark to market is really hard to do in this market because there isn't a market for a lot of these securities. You can't find anybody who's willing to buy them or if you sell them, you have to sell them at fire sale, fire sale prices and get you know 20 cents on the dollar or 10 cents on the dollar. And so uh, these rules don't work too terribly well when there isn't a very well-established market or it's an artificially low market. Maybe artificially low because of the, the liquidity problems. So then the rules are, well, you have to use a model then. You have to use a model and do your best with the model. And the models don't work very well. So there are a lot of problems in, in writing stuff down. And now let me uh, explain to you how that works uh, with, a, with a, uh, a visual. So this is a bank. It's got a whole bunch of assets on one side of the balance sheet and a bunch of liabilities on the other side. The difference is, of course, uh, equity, equity capital. So you've got all your loans to customers, investments, cash, stuff like that, buildings on the asset side. Then you've got your deposits where you get your money, and then the difference is equity capital. And that means you know past profits and losses and stock purchases and adjustments and things like that. And then we've defined, you know, what, what it takes to be a healthy bank. And that, that number should be anywhere from about 8 to 10 percent to 12 percent to have a, have a healthy bank. And that percentage of equity capital is a percentage of the total assets or total liabilities and equity. Okay, now what happens if you have some of the assets were in CMOs or CDOs? We call those toxic assets. They're these, these nice packages of things, and it turns out the contents have rotted inside. <laughs> They're toxic. And uh, we don't know what they're worth, but let's suppose we had to write them down. If you write them down, what happens? Now the assets are much less than they were before. Let's suppose we had to write down that amount, all those toxic assets, to zero, just for simplicity. Okay, now we have to make the, the right side and the left side balance. So the only way to do that is to uh, uh, look at the assets and liabilities and say, oops, the liabilities are larger than the assets. So the only balancing thing we have is, is uh, equity. And so that now is negative. You have to put in a negative number for the equity. And negative 3%, let's say, whoops, that's bad. That's below the uh, requirement for a healthy bank. And if you have a negative equity, then you've got to do something about it, according to, uh, accounting, uh, according to bank regulatory rules and SEC and so on. You've got to do something about it. And 
anyway, we'll come back to what, what was done about that. Because here's what happened. Uh, it started with uh, housing prices were going up and up and up. People were selling CMOs and CDOs and CDSs and everything was going fine. And then we began to realize that uh, we hadn't built a million more homes than we needed in the country, at least a million more. And in August of 07, prices began to turn around. So they began to slip, especially in some of the hot markets like Phoenix and Las Vegas and California, Florida, et cetera. And then we began to realize what those actual risks were. They were much worse than we thought. Default rates were a lot higher than we thought they were going to be, much higher than historically. And so nobody wanted to buy these CMOs and CDOs because they didn't know how to value them, didn't know what was inside those pretty packages. And so the, the prices fell dramatically and what we used to be AAA now was uh, junk, and so the counting rule said you have to write them down. And you can't let this negative equity stand now with all these banks having negative equity, so you got to do something about it. So Bear Stearns, a company had been around since 1923, was sold last March to J.P. Morgan Chase, initially for $2 a share, they up to $10 a share, and uh, the previous year that was $133 a share. So imagine if your retirement was tied up in, in, in that, that company and worked for them for a long time. Countrywide Financial, largest uh, mortgage uh, company in, in America, was bought by B of A, was losing uh, t uh, you know, billions of dollars a month. IndyMac was uh, seized. Uh, Lehman Brothers, a firm been around, had been around since 1850, was uh, 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 sold, pieces were sold to Barclays and, and Nomura. Washington Mutual, WAMU, uh, was seized by the FDIC, sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, some of them uh, found larger competitors. Merrill Lynch uh, sold off its toxic assets at 20 cents on the dollar and, and then uh, merged with Bank of America. Big, big uh, snafu over uh, paying of huge bonuses, $4 billion in bonuses by Merrill Lynch before the, uh, uh, the merger. Wachovia emerged, is emerging, in the process of merging with well, Wells Fargo. And some companies, Morgan Stanley, the company I'm associated with, sold 21% uh, of its uh, assets to uh, uh, Mitsubishi last October. Goldman Sachs, rescued by Warren Buffett, uh, somewhat rescued anyway. Uh, government took over Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Government essentially took over AIG and is pumping millions into that. AIG, as you know, just the other day had a $62 billion loss, the largest loss in the history of the world. Uh, no company's ever lost more money in a quarter than, uh, than AIG did. Okay, so now what's happening? Right now we're in a, a situation where no institution wants to loan money to any other institutions or any other borrowers because nobody knows who's next on the chopping block. And uh, uh, unfortunately they don't want to loan money to individuals as well because they don't know uh, how individuals are going to fare in this economy. So even healthy companies have to borrow. Our, co our country, our economy runs on borrowing. Uh, people say, well, you know, just don't borrow. You know, uh, people have to borrow to finance their receivables. They have to borrow for uh, mismatches of inflows and outflows, even very, very healthy companies. So this is a huge problem where the um, uh, credit markets have essentially seized up and nobody is willing to, to lend. There's some, some um, a softening of that that's going on as I've, I've been in some committee meetings recently that look like that might be softening up. And consumers feel much poorer. <coughs> Their 401ks have headed south. I went down to uh, Ecuador last November and somebody asked me, if, if you go down there, if you see my 401k, tell it hello. It's, last time I saw it was headed south. <laughs> Uh, uh, our home equity has gone down, job uncertainty, so, so consumers are not buying, so retailers are not selling. Now, there just re recent news about that this morning, that looks a little bit better than we, we uh, anticipated. And so we ran the risk of seeing the entire economy shut down uh, last fall. And so uh, uh, and the other problem is we're connected to everybody else. Uh, this, this $70 billion uh, global fixed, uh, fixed income market uh, that's, that's worldwide, and so everybody was buying these CDOs and C CMOs and things uh, all around the world. So everybody is hurting now. And uh, Britain has a worse housing problem than we have in terms of foreclosures and such. So lots and lots of problems all over the world, so it's, it's all, uh, all, and we're all connected. So uh, we had to do something. So uh, one of the things that happened in the Great Depression was they constricted the money supply. The Fed constricted the money supply and said, "Well, we're not going to let uh, you know. We're not going to pay more more money into the economy because the, the banks will just lose it. So we're going to restrict it." So they did. They tightened spending, and that probably caused the Great Depression. 
So having learned that lesson, at least we think we know that lesson, we don't know if we're even in the same territory now. <laughs> Uh, uh, the government and, uh, and the Bush administration, they, they put forward a plan to in, invest uh, in uh, troubled assets, uh, and so they, they passed a, a $700 billion uh, TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program. It turns out they didn't buy many toxic assets, that, but they preferred instead to uh, invest in those banks, uh, put money in, in uh, 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 preferred stock and warrants. Uh, rather than buy the assets directly, because they didn't know how to price. Nobody knows how to price those toxic assets. Uh, so that money, a lot of that money, has been paid out. Almost 350 has been paid out uh, to date. And they're all. The Federal Reserve is also assisting uh, much more money than that is is going out to assist other banks to buy failed banks or to buy uh, other other things that are failing. So there's a lot of uh, money being. Uh, uh, sent out through the Federal Reserve. Now, what happens when we infuse money into this bank now that I showed you earlier that had these its toxic assets disappear? You get cash in as an asset, and so now the equity capital goes up. So now we have a good bank. So, so that's what's happening uh, uh, there. Now, uh, the government effort uh, B, Part B, as the Obama uh, stimulus package, which was just uh, passed and, and uh, just went through the uh, both houses and uh, the conference committee is has fixed all that, and we have a plan there, uh, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but uh, there, there are also other plans afoot in addition to that to aid homeowners. I heard some of that on the radio this morning. Uh, the FDIC increased uh, uh, in, in insurance limits on their on deposits, so now instead of 100000 that you're insured for in a bank, you can be insured for more. Uh, and then uh, we've also seen some, some of the TARP assets and some other uh, efforts to bail out the auto industry and possibly other, other industries. So this is uh, just a very brief overview of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Act of uh, 2009. This is the, the Obama uh, 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 stimulus package. 39% uh, of that went to federal agencies and programs. 61% went to individuals and states, including a lot of tax cuts. You can see the numbers there. Other provisions, uh, there's a payroll tax cut that's been affected. Uh, uh, credit for first-time home buyers has been put in place with additional things being talked about for uh, those who are under foreclosure. Higher education received a, a chunk. Uh, unemployment tax uh, uh, benefits uh, will, uh, will go on. And then help for new car buyers and things like that to try to stimulate the automotive industry. And then uh, tax reductions total about 288 of the $787 billion plan. I know there are arguments on both sides saying, well, you know, uh, the Republicans want more tax benefits, and, and, and probably if the Republicans had done, it, had done it, it would have been a little bit different, but not, not a whole lot different. The, the fact of the matter is getting money into the economy is the important thing, so that it will hopefully stimulate the economy. Now, some of this uh, 787 doesn't happen, a lot of it doesn't happen until next year or the year after. Some of the infrastructure stuff doesn't happen for uh, a year or so. You, you know, to build a bridge, you've got to uh, take some planning and, and, and some effort there. And possible outcomes. The worst case uh, is a prolonged depression similar to the 1930s. We haven't been able to rule that out. Most people haven't ruled that out. Most economists haven't ruled that out. And that's when we have um, unemployment. Back then it was about around 25 percent, and there was no growth for three to five years, no growth in the, in the economy in terms of GDP, and tremendous personal hardship. I mean, imagine 25 percent of the people in the country being without work. And, and many of the other 75 percent being on, on much less than they had had before. So that's, that's the worst case. We hope we have the controls in place to keep the worst case from happening. The best case would be a short recession similar to ones we've had in the past where unemployment just goes up to 6 to 8 percent. It's, it's in that range right now uh, where we have no or slow growth for 6 to 18 months. Uh, probably, I think most economists would come out on, on a, a, a rather serious recession, more serious than the ones we've had in the past where un unemployment approaches 10 percent and we have no growth for about one to two years. Uh, I'm hoping that that will be the, 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 the situation. I'd, I'd, I'd like for the best case, but the most likely one is, is probably going to, going to be with us. Uh, now, there'll be some other outgrowths of what, what have, have happened here, and we'll just, a lot of these we'll see as we go forward. I suspect we'll have much more regulation of the securities industry, including hedge funds. Those have been totally, almost totally unregulated up to this point in time. The Bernie Madoff situation, for example. Uh, and uh, mortgage, packaged mortgages and other assets are going to have a lot more regulation surrounding them, credit default swaps, of course. And I wouldn't uh, be surprised if, if uh, some of the risk had to be maintained by 
the lower level, you know, forming those mortgages that some of the mortgage companies will have to retain some of that before passing it on, so they have some skin in the game too. Uh, right now, there's, there's no separation between investment banks and the, and the commercial banking uh, uh, industries, which uh, were the case because of Glass-Steagall that was passed back in 1933. Morgan Stanley Bank, for example, uh, uh, was a Utah Industrial Loan Corporation out here in Utah. It was owned by Morgan Stanley, the investment company, because they, they couldn't legally hold another bank, but they could hold, hold an uh, industrial loan corporation because Utah has some very lax laws about uh, industrial loan corporations. So I was on the board of that one. It was about $7 billion. Uh, now it's about uh, $60 billion, and, and now it's a New York City bank, and it's uh, uh, now, now, now uh, uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs have both been given permission to own banks. So there's no separation now between the investment industry and the banking industry. And the government could actually find itself making some return if they were to buy these toxic assets because probably a lot of them are priced way below where, where they'll eventually end up. That would be interesting to see. And I suspect that eventually we'll have to seize higher taxes to pay for the bailout. It wouldn't be good to impose them now because that would uh, not stimulate a, a recovery. And I suspect that inflation could become a problem later on because how is this bailout funded? We have to borrow more money uh, uh, from uh, others in order to fund the bailout. And uh, borrowing more means uh, putting more demand on the market. Interest rates will rise and, and uh, prices may rise as well eventually. Now, suggestions for individuals. Uh, don't panic. A lot of people, when they see the markets at, at their lows for a past dozen years, uh, say, i got to get out of the market. That, that's probably the worst time to sell to sell is when, when it's at uh, the lowest. The stock market has always been a leading indicator by about uh, uh, 9 to 16 months, and it, it usually picks up far ahead of the rest of the economy and, and could, could turn around and, uh, at some point. At least we hope it does. In fact, now might be a good time to buy because there's some awfully good uh, – good bargain basement prices, and they might even get more bargain basement in the future. Uh, if you're employed, become a very valuable employee. Sharpen your skills. Dust off your resume, because I suspect that employment is going to, unemployment is going to increase. Now may it be a good time to go back to school. Uh, 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 especially lower cost schools are seeing a huge you know, increase in demand as people say, well, I don't have a very good job. I'm going I'm to lose it anyway. I'm going to go back to school. And make sure your food supply is in good order. Uh, teach your children and grandchildren sound financial principles. Uh, now, a very important suggestion, I think, for, the, for our, our audience, for us personally, is to heed the words of prophets. Uh, who said this? We wish the presidencies of the stakes and bishops of the wards and to urge earnestly and always upon the people the paramount necessity of living righteously and avoiding extravagance, cultivating habits of thrift and economy and industry, living strictly within their incomes, laying aside something, however small for the amount may be, for times of greater stress that may come to us. And who said that? That was the first presidency in 1933. Uh, President Hinckley in 1998. Now remember what the market was doing in 1998? It was going up. This was the big bull market uh, just before the, uh, the uh, crash of uh, the dot-com era. He told the story, this was in a priesthood meeting, by the way. He told the story of Pharaoh and a dream of seven fat and, and seven lean cattle. And he said, I want to make it very clear I'm not prophesying. I'm not predicting years of famine in the future, but I am suggesting the time has come to get our houses in order. There is a portent of stormy weather ahead to which we had better give heed. So many of our people are living on the very edge of their incomes. In fact, some are living on borrowings, continuing on. I urge you, brethren, because it was a priesthood meeting, to look to the condition of your finances, be modest in expenditures, discipline yourself, avoid debt where possible, pay off debt as quickly as you can. He mentioned debt many times in this talk. <clears throat> and then he said something I've never heard uh, President of the Church say in this way. That's all I have to say about it, but I wish to say it with all the emphasis of which I am capable. When a prophet of God says something like that, we might say, wow, maybe I should listen to that. <laughs> That's a great of advice, and he's uh, reiterated that uh, in other times after the, uh, the crash of the dot-com era. He counseled again and again, so many people are heavily in debt. Get free of debt where you can, have a little laid aside. Uh, Elder Worthland talks about the same thing, about uh, debt being the illusion of prosperity. We think we own things, but things really, uh, our things really own us. 
and he talks about debt for a modest home and expenses for education, perhaps for perhaps a needed first car, but but uh, not for for uh, commodities. And Elder Perry in, in the November last November conference, uh, and he talked about being encouraged in, in almost every general conference not to live beyond our means. And then he quotes Heber J. Grant, who said uh, in another leg going back, from my earliest recollections from the days of Brigham Young until now. I have listened to men, the men standing at the pulpit urging people not to run into debt, and I believe that the great majority of our, all our troubles today is caused through the failure to carry out that counsel. That was 1921, the, during the, the Roaring 20s. My last advice uh, from President Packer it gives me great comfort. It is my purpose to show that in troubled times, the Lord has always prepared a safe way ahead. We live in those perilous times which the Apostle Paul prophesied would come in the last days. If we are to be safe individually, as families, and secure as a church, it will be through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Well, I hope that we can uh, have learned a little bit about what may, may have caused the perils that we're in now, and, and, uh, and hopefully we'll listen to uh, uh, wise leaders who will, will help us as we move forward.